Welcome to the Business in Real Life podcast. We're here to help you start your business. Today, we're gonna talk about how to launch a brand in 2021. What do you need to do? How do you position yourself to find the customer that you want? Let's jump into it. So I'm really excited about this podcast today because I think this covers a lot of fun information that a lot of people don't think about, but also covers the stuff that you do think about, but kind of jumps into depth. So I'm excited to jump into it. Branding is really fun. And it's one of those things that I really nerd out about. (laughs) Um, Well, I can just, when we started talking about which one are we going to do next? This one really stuck with me recently. My friend who knows that I love talking about branding brought this company up to me and said, when I go from their Instagram to their page, I feel like it's a different company, Mm. a completely different company. And then I walked through it. It's a child. um, They make these couches that you can take apart and build forts with. That's fun. And they're really cool. So when I went to their website, I could see what they were going for. It was really playful, really fun. And all of the letters around it, all the colors are bright. Um, but then when you go to their Instagram, it's all these reposts from these Pinterest moms and their houses look immaculate and beautiful and they still look playful, but it still looked a little bit different. Hmm. So we had this discussion on, she was like, I just feel like I'm shopping on a random China website that is faking like they're this company, but weird. So you guys felt like through all the stuff, you felt like the actual website wasn't living up to the hype. Like you were more disappointed in the website. Right. So I could see where they were going with the website and we'll cover a lot of the things. So I can bring that up when we talk about each of these uh, different sub plots of the podcast. But um, yeah, the website just looked um, a little bit cheaper Mm -hmm. than their Instagram. Their Instagram comes off very professional and very Pinteresty, if you will. So creating that illusion that our house is perfect even during playtime. <laughs> you know, it doesn't even get messy and these are so perfect. Um, but I see what they're doing with their website too. So maybe we can figure out a fix for that by the end of the podcast. <laughs> but that's kind of what gave me the idea for this is just keeping a cohesive brand so that when people are jumping from your website to your TikTok to your Instagram, they're like, oh, that is that brand. I know exactly what I'm in for. Well, just starting at the beginning, I think really defining what is a brand? What is your brand? How do you start this brand? How, you know, there's so many, like, it seems so simple when you see a brand, it's like, oh, well, it's just Nike with a swoosh. Like what an easy thing, but there's so much behind the scenes of what color do we use? How do we actually position that logo? How do we can keep consistently, consistently push the same message across all of our social and our website so it feels like one cohesive thing it's actually like yeah we can jump super super into depth this will probably be one of a series i'm guessing because we can go on for hours but uh, the first thing that we wanted to talk about is really defining the brand like what are your values what makes you unique like why would a stranger come in and buy your product like, I think that's whenever people ask me, like, like, OK, what what's the first step in even starting anything? That's 100 percent where I start. We think a lot of like, OK, I would buy this, but it's like, why would a stranger buy your hoodie with your logo on it? They wouldn't. Your friends right. and family will, but a stranger might not. It's really easy to think you have come up with this awesome idea. But right now you got to have that brand too, because you can't sell something if you don't have a brand. It's all about or creating that supply for something you think there's a demand for um, just outside of your house, not just you, because you might be alone and thinking, oh, this is going to change the world, but only five people want to buy it. Totally. Um, On Shark Tank, these people just pitched this thing that collects hair in your shower and all of the sharks roasted them. They're like, no one will use this. No one will want to buy this. And it was kind of sad because I'm like, dude, why did they even put them on Shark Tank? Like, it was so embarrassing because there's no demand for that. Crazy. So creating something that people will actually use is the first step, whether it's an idea or an actual physical product or an event. And even with that, I was watching this podcast with Colin and Samir. They're one of my favorite YouTube channels. And they uh, they had 
Nas Daily on there who he was he's like a Facebook adventure he anyway he he made like one minute videos every day for a thousand days and so literally for three years or something like that he made a video every single day and posted it on facebook he has something like 20 million followers on facebook um and he's built this big empire around it so it was really interesting to hear but the thing that he really said that he he believes he nailed like and got lucky with but he nailed was a supply versus demand issue right at the time that he that he started making videos, Facebook video just started. And nobody nobody really knew what to do with Facebook video. So there's this huge demand for this uh, product that he then created, right? And I think with businesses in general, we make what we th- want to make. Uh, uh, here's a great example. With Gravel, we our first product was a toiletry bag. The toiletry bag, we saw a demand that nobody was really focusing on toiletry bags and making something cool. So we made something cool, and then now everybody's copied it because they realized that there was a demand there that wasn't met. The same thing with our travel blanket. It's like, yeah, there's no, there's still not really many travel blankets out there, there and there's a huge demand totally. for it. But with our backpack system, I think that that's our biggest flaw so far with gravel because it was something we were excited to make and we kind of ignored the fact that there wasn't a huge demand for it because there's a million different right. backpacks that do a million different things. So I think we are a little bit off on our supply versus our demand. And now we see that to some extent, like our, our toiletry bag sales are way higher than our backpack sales because we didn't hit like we hit a really broad audience the without much demand versus like a really specific niche audience that we can hit really hard, you know? Hey friends, sorry, quick intermission. I just wanted to quickly ask if you would subscribe. Uh, It means a lot, it honestly helps our channel a ton. It helps us to get eyeballs to people starting businesses that wouldn't otherwise see us. So it's free for you, which is the best part. Super easy, if you'd subscribe, that would be so great. Anyway, back to the video. So I think really we can jump into it and like talk about a few things that that you should point out when you're first starting and literally physically write these down. Like, okay, the first is who are you selling to? So you can define like, is this, are you selling to a 15 year old, a 30 year old, a 60 year old? Who is this person? Are they a male, a female, both focus on people and be very specific instead of saying, yeah, oh, well, yeah, it's a 15 to 60 year old male or female. It's like, well, that doesn't give you any information. Really try and hone down and be really strict with like, who this person is. Yeah, and something that we did and that everyone should do is create an actual profile. Who are you selling to? When I'm in these brand meetings and these marketing meetings with Lance for Gravel, I want to market, and our persona, his name is Kevin. Kevin loves traveling. Kevin shops at Sprouts. Kevin likes going to REI but wants to support small, so he comes to a, a website like Gravel. You can make this persona. It can even be a customer that actually purchased from you. Or you can just say, this is my ideal customer and this is who I'm making this for. Totally. What do they do for work? What do they do when they're not working? What Are they married or are they single? Uh, What's important to them? Is being eco-friendly important to them? Things like that. You build out this persona. Mm -hmm. You sell to that person. And one of the best pieces of advice that Lance and I got from someone we know is not to get too excited about other, like if you have a hot product that's selling outside of your demographic, don't change your ideal persona because one random demographic comes in and loves your product. Mm. They're going to buy the product anyway. So stay true to that persona, to who you're selling to. And you can make little changes and you can have emails that are directed towards that sub demographic, but staying true to your like core three personas is huge. Even if you see, so like I said, Kevin is like in his thirties, he buys from us, he loves all those things. But then with our blanket, we had a little bit of an older audience and women coming in and buying our blanket, which was new to gravel. But that doesn't mean we're going to start selling everything to Deborah. You know, our branding still stayed very true to Kevin. The kind of creepy thing, but the cool thing that we did was because we have actual data, we were able to actually go and find our customers. So Kevin is literally someone who's bought our toiletry bag, and then we can find him on LinkedIn, 
Instagram, everywhere. We can see how he lives and we can actually figure out like, right. oh, okay, what are products that Kevin would actually want? And I think the the example that I think of is like, okay, what's going to be easier? If you're trying to sell, let's just say a pen, right? A pen's a traditional, use, whatever. If you're trying to sell this pen, what is easier? Selling it to somebody face-to-face where you know that person, selling it like selling it to one of your friends where you know their history, or is it easier to sell it to a full crowd? You know what I mean? You're going to be able to sell it to your friend way easier because you understand who that person is. You understand their needs and wants a lot better versus just trying to blast it out to a whole crowd. For sure, you're going to sell some because there's some people in there. But if you can sell it to a crowd of your friend, right, a crowd of Kevin's and figure out who Kevin is, all of a sudden you're going to sell to the entire crowd versus just shotgunning to the whole crowd, right? Right. And those people will come back and they'll tell their friends and they're going to be pumped because it's not something that they saw and they grabbed for 10 bucks at Target. Totally. It's going to be, hey, I invested in this thing. It's really cool. It changed how I travel. You know, it. Kevin's are more important than the masses. <laughs> totally. And also to add on to your story, we've talked to Kevin. We're friends with him. And... It's just really fun. It's cool to ask your customers, hey, what do you want to see? How do you travel? Yeah, all the time. Kevin, Kevin specifically, and there's a few others, that when we have a product in the works, we reach out to him and we're like, hey, uh, what do you think of this product? What do you think of these colorways? What do you think of, you know? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, cool. They have like, we're getting a pretty good grasp on what this audience of Kevin's will actually want because we're physically asking Kevin. And we even FaceTimed like five people. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we were about to launch our travel backpacks, and it was humbling and also just so fun because it's really easy to get down on yourself when you're running a small business. But then you see these customers and they're like, your blanket changed my life. Your tra- like I got my son and all of his friends toiletry bags. It's really cool. So what do people do if they don't have any customers yet? I think the majority of these people won't have right. customers at all. But I think you can follow a lot of these same strategies, right? You can think of people in your life still that you believe will fall into this demographic. So it's like, oh, yeah, I have a friend named Tyler. Uh, He's six foot two. Uh, He buys groceries wherever is the cheapest groceries. Uh, They make money. They have a full time job. And uh, what do they do when they're not when they aren't working? Uh, Well, he likes to go on hikes. Right. All of a sudden it's like, okay, that's specifically who I'm selling to because that's actually one of my friends who I think will buy this product and is excited about this product. So it doesn't you don't necessarily have to have customers to like really envision a specific person. Just find those people in your life and then write down the things about them that make them fall into the niche that you're wanting to pitch. If that makes sense. The niche you're wanting to pitch. (laughs) I love that. TM, we just trademarked that. Um, What's your opinion on making the persona yourself selling to Lance's? That's a good question. I think that there's pros and cons to it. The main con is we don't understand ourselves, right? We have this introspective view of (laughs) ourselves. It really is. But it's like you, you never know how the world perceives you. You just know how you perceive the world perceiving you. You know what I mean? But you know how... I know how I perceive Tyler and I can guess that it's, that's likely more similar. His friends all likely view Tyler in a similar fashion versus, and that's probably significantly different than how Tyler views Tyler. And if you like Tyler, then you're kind of like Tyler. So in a way. And I think every brand that you build, if you're excited about it, like Gravel, for instance, I'm super nitpicky about branding and things with Gravel that don't matter at all to anyone except for me. And I think that that little twist of Lance in there, the little goofiness that we use in branding, whatever, the little twist of Lance in there adds to the brand. And so I think that for sure, adding your own spin to things and your own outlook to things is definitely something you do. But when you're actually pinpointing a specific person, you should likely likely use someone else versus yourself, unless you really feel confident. <laughs> yeah, totally. And that goes into brand story like you just said, when you started Gravel with Chris, you can see why the brand is important to you, especially like the color orange. Now that Gravel's orange, I whenever I see orange, I am just like, yep, that's Lance, that's Gravel. <laughs> uh, 
But since it's so important to you, you can see these little touches from you, even like from me and Chris, it's fun to show, hey, we're a small business. This is why it's important to us. And it, that translates to it being important to other people. So really, when you're starting out, the first step is to figure out who your customer is. The second step is figure out who your brand is. So like just like what you were just saying, are you a fun brand? Are you a serious brand? Do you use bright colors? Do you use muted colors? Are you using trendy colors? Try and figure out really broad what you are first, and then you can go back in and say, okay, we're a fun brand. Okay, am I a fun person? Can I really push out that branding that way? Or do I need to figure out how to hire or work with someone, a copywriter of some kind, who has a more fun voice that I'm looking for? Uh, okay, it does orange. You know, I really, I love orange right now. Like physically, I actually really love orange right now. I'm obsessed with orange. But it's like, okay, is that the brand? Is that Lance? Is that is that a mixture of both? In this case, it's kind of a mixture of both. That's me like protruding myself onto the brand. But on top of that, you have to say, okay, does that fit what I want this brand to be? Is it is it a bright color brand that can pull that off? And so just in general, I think that there's a good a good way of going really broad and then honing that in specifically to specific colors, to specific names, to specific wording after you've figured out like what broad category you fall into. And that goes into all, or all the things you just said go into the aesthetic side of a brand, but also like the internal parts of a brand, uh, like the copywriting, for instance, we're really fun. So we use words like rad, dude, um, awesome, but that wouldn't work if you're a really niche chocolatier based out of Chicago. You wouldn't <laughs> want to, like, if you're, like, a French baker or something, that wouldn't be as on brand. So that's something you need to decide. Are you going to be more formal? And the key to all of this is just sticking with it. Don't post one thing on Instagram that's, like, rad, dude, awesome, and then your website is, like, our toiletry bag is very great for people that like huh. traveling. You know, totally. keeping it consistent is huge. And then the other side is the aesthetics, which you're really amazing at. So I want you to talk about all the aesthetic, like the color and just graphic design. We could go on and on about that. But I think that something to, uh, something that we didn't really connect the dots to very well is so you're, you're creating the first step was creating Tyler or figuring out who Tyler is, whether it's your friend or a customer or whoever it is. When you're when you're deciding all these broad things like color and language and design, you're thinking about Tyler the whole time, right? Like you're saying, right. okay, how does Tyler talk? That's probably how we should talk. What kind of colors right. does Tyler wear? If I'm creating a backpack, would Tyler wear a bright orange backpack? Probably not, you know, or, or maybe he does. And so it's like all of a sudden it's it's pretty easy to decide like, okay, what would Tyler like? Okay, we can decide these things. So once you've kind of hit that point, um, I, I can qu quickly go over like how I decide on a brand and color and things like that. Um, so first of all, logo, branding, all that stuff branding specifically like creating an actual logo is so hard <laughs> like so just know if it's you're so hard if you're getting into it and you're so frustrated for every brand i've ever created i get so frustrated for a long time and then all of a sudden something clicks and it's like oh oh the cool this is actually the direction this is the thing right. i want to you know but for a long time i mean probably for the first like six or seven years of creating branding I was never totally happy with the branding. It's only been the last two or three years or four years or something like that that like I've been creating these brands that I'm like, oh, actually, this is pretty cool. And a huge part of that, like that transition, obviously putting time in and understanding branding and looking at logos and designing logos, that all goes into it. But the second thing was really assigning color palettes to your brand right. elevates a logo so much more. So I wanted to show you guys how I kind of do that um, I literally just, uh, Google like color palette generator and you can see, I clicked on this. This one is super, hopefully this is the correct one. So yeah, that's sweet. 
This is one of my favorite ways to do color palettes. And, it, and before there was a button, I just can't find it right now, but there was a button that you could just push and it would auto generate. Randomize. Uh, yeah, it would just it would just randomize. And that's, I actually love doing that. But here, I mean, we can just rig it and literally just pl press refresh. Nope, maybe not. Well, dumb. Maybe it was a different, it looked like this website. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You can find web, like generators where you can just go and randomly browse. I mean, even on this, you can just click explore. I just liked that it was coming up on like a full page. Uh, but you can just scroll down through this. Right, and I saw that you hopped on to Canva also has things like this, Adobe, and you don't have to have a subscription for the Adobe version of this. Um, even Pinterest, you can just search mood boards and a lot of ideas for branding can come up with uh, color palette. Just in general, finding something that fits your brand, whether, you know, in any, there's so many different places that you can find it, will elevate your brand a ton and make you recognizable. And it just makes things easy too. Like That's true. Once you get these colors into place, like Lance is showing you, write them down and keep the keep the hex codes in one place is, or one in one place so that when you're creating a piece of content, you won't have to worry about, oh, what color did we use last week or what color are we using on our packaging? Keep it consistent, keep it recognizable. And then it's just so much easier to get things done if you have that um, branding style guide. Totally. So there are examples of this on a line on Pinterest where you have your typefaces, you have your colors, your like your color palette, and even how you make some graphics. So for gravel, we like to use a lot of raw edges with the paintbrush on... Photoshop. So that's on our branding style guide. So when I go to make an email, I just have those saved onto my Photoshop so that it's just boom, easy. I use the eyedropper or I type in the code and it just makes everything go so much faster. Totally. And once you have that too, it's like just everything across the board. So if you're creating a thumbnail for YouTube, use those colors. If you're creating a graphic for right. Instagram, use those colors. If you're like no matter in your emails, you create those colors. And that consistency that we were talking about earlier across the brand will look way more in unison because the colors you're using on everything are the same. So I think that's a pretty easy way to do it. Um, jumping into actual fonts, um, you also need to consider like, okay, what kind of brand am I? Am I am I going to be a more playful brand? And then you can use some like more like rounder corners or uh, just more playful fonts. Uh, if you're more serious, then you know you need like a Helv Helvetica or more traditional font. Maybe better for a logo. Um, like different fonts call fall into different categories. There's the uh, so not to put anyone on blast, but I'm about to. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I wasn't planning on saying this, but uh, there's a company <laughs> called Harmon Brothers uh, that's here in Provo, and they do they made like the squatty potty video where uh, the poopery the poopery the unicorns pooping. Anyway, so let's see. I'll pull this up. Here's their logo. To me, they're a video production company, yet their logo looks like a university logo. It looks like this is like, yeah, because it's a big blocky. A lot of times blockier letters are more for colleges or for universities, but they decided to use that. And every time I see it, I'm like, I just get so frustrated because I'm so confused by their messaging. Now, and maybe and I they mean, are such a fun brand, too. Totally. So they're missing out because they are hilarious. And maybe they knew something I didn't because now they, they are actually teaching a lot of people how to how to create videos like they have so maybe now they are more educational so now i guess it makes sense but uh the other thing i wanted to show is maybe you don't know fonts very well but you want to this uh i just googled um find font from image and uh i've used this a bunch of times before on fontsquirrel.com slash match maturator <laughs> so that's way rad look up that anyway you can literally just grab an image uh, that's a that you screenshotted from a website or whatever upload it to this and it'll tell you what like what font that that image is in right that's so cool 
Yeah. Then you can go download that. That's actually how I found the font for Makers Academy. Is there something else that had that font? I was like, oh, this is the feel I want. Throw it in there. You can obviously make the logo your own. So I adjusted the logo. I, I merged some letters. I did some things to it to make it like a logo instead of just a font. But this is a really, really good place to start. You can create eight outlines in Illustrator, kind of modify it how you want. And all of a sudden, you're sitting way better. I think those two things combined, finding a font that really matches and a color palette, all of a sudden, your branding in like a couple hours will skyrocket. It'll be way, way higher than it would have if you're just like sitting down trying to like figure out what your brand is. And all this stuff, I mean, also envisioning Tyler, like what colors does Tyler like? What kind of font matches Tyler's lifestyle? All this stuff like... It all comes together when you're creating the branding, the logo, the coloring. And I'll definitely link all of the things we've mentioned in the description. Um, those are some really awesome and free tools. So there's no reason not to use them. But um, one more thing about typeface. If any of you use Comic Sans or Papyrus, we're, <laughs> I will fight you. I will ban you from from the internet. Unless you're being because, ironic. For a rap Unless you're like <laughs> making a meme yeah, or something. Brooke and I are making a fun brand that's really meme focused and we will likely use Papyrus and Comic Sans ironically because ironically. it's fun. So there's a time and place. But if but... anyone, just delete Comic Sans and Papyrus from your <laughs> font catalog. Don't touch it. Don't even joke about it. This is getting in pretty deep. But when you're picking a font, make sure that you can use it commercially. You don't want, and there are a lot of free fonts that you can use commercially, but if you get any off uh, DeFont or anything, sometimes they're not free. Uh, so just be careful there. But there's so many free resources, so that's not even a big worry. But I, I get excited sometimes and I use things and I'm like, oh, I need a commercial license for that. Yeah, and it can be frustrating for sure. Oh, let's see if I can find freaking... You know who bugs me more than anything else? Man, I'm just putting people on blast today, but let's see. Oh, <laughs> oh, did they update their logo? Edible arrangements. Yeah, they did. Boom, papyrus for the longest time. And I was like, what are you doing? It's still their logo is not good, but it's much better than what it was. Hey, but we can look at it. And some of the things that we've talked about is their logo. So they have red, which makes you a little bit hungry mm. and i think they are kind of catering to an older audience so i might have to eat my words a little bit here <laughs> but papyrus is working for the people that do buy from them maybe yeah so maybe um, you should go on microsoft word to make your logo <laughs> yeah use word oh, art and those worst. cool gradients but really good to look at logos look at logos you like put them in a document um don't copy them but Definitely don't use papyrus. <laughs> yeah, just in general, but, logos are really hard. Don't be scared. Like, you don't have to make something 100% original. Like, all the logos I've ever done, right. even the gravel logo, right? It's it's a, what is the original font? It honestly is like a Hel Helvetica new bold, I think is what it started out as. Right. But then I modified slightly, and then the little slices out of it, it's because I saw a photographer slash graphic designer made something um, where the grass was coming up and the wherever a blade of grass was, he cut off the letter there so that it kind of looks like it was going behind. But I was like, oh, that's actually that's a cool sick. concept for a logo. So like, just get inspired, follow a lot of people that you're inspired by and you'll be golden. But all in all, that's a pretty good boot camp for branding. <laughs> yeah, say. serious though. I, I'm pumped for this video to come out because I think this is like, yeah, in 20 minutes, this can take you literally from like the worst logo ever to like sitting pretty freaking good. So I think overall, what's stopping you from starting your brand right now? We want to cover that. We want to help you to start your business, to start your brand, whether that's clothing or whether that's like a revolutionary idea that you really want to start. So let us don't know down in the comments what's holding you back, what you're scared about, uh, what steps seem overwhelming. Let us know and uh, we'll make videos covering that. But hopefully this one uh, brought you your branding, helped you to get a little elevated, helped you get a little excited. And uh, also leave your websites down below. 
of these new logos that you've created and your websites in general and we'll go check them out and give you some feedback down there too so yeah we're always looking at the comments so like really leave us a comment i'm waiting <laughs> <laughs> we're looking for you we're l we are looking we will find you <laughs> uh thanks so much for joining today uh you guys are great we really like spending time with you and uh yeah we'll chat soon next tuesday peace